Um, the problem is, if the fatwa you are being given seems to contradict something else you know about Islam. Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah, uh, one of the greatest students of Ibn Taymiyyah, a medieval Muslim scholar, said, um, Sharia is all about the attainment of welfare, human welfare, in this world and in the hereafter. In its entirety, it's about justice, mercy, wisdom, and benefit. Justice, mercy, wisdom, and benefit. He goes on to say, any ruling, any ruling that goes from justice to injustice, that goes from mercy to its opposite, or wisdom to folly, or benefit to harm, is a ruling that does not belong to Sharia. Even if somebody claims it's according to some interpretation. In other words, Sharia law cannot produce rulings that go contrary to the objectives and the maqasid of Sharia. Now, because the study of usul is quite complicated, the study of maqasid, which is the study of the objectives, is quite easy. So, for example, um, Bilal is driving me somewhere in Nigeria. I don't know the way, I don't know how to drive. But we have agreed we are going to Sokoto, not Lagos. He finally says, okay, we have arrived. And I see forests. <laughs> and I see tall buildings everywhere. Because I know what the destination is, I know he must have made a mistake somewhere. I don't know what the mistake was. I don't know why he did the wrong turn. But there's a problem. I'll consult somebody else. I don't know enough about medicine to be a doctor or to go into self-medication. But I know enough about medicine that when I come to my doctor and he gives me a prescription, I go back. I came walking the first time. Next I come limping. He gives me medication. Next I'm coming in a wheelchair. He gives me medication. Next I'm coming half unconscious. You know, I don't have to be a doctor to say, you know what, yeah, let's try another doctor. Yeah. You go to a doctor and he tells you, um, take six tablets of this antibiotic six times a day. I don't need to be a doctor to say, antibiotics? Six times a day? Six tablets? Hi. Yeah. You, know, you consult with somebody else who may know better. Um, so, what a, what a study of Kawanid and Makasid, in that these are similar subjects, do is it makes you more critical. It doesn't mean you know how to give fatwas or you know how to do ijtihad, but at least you can identify ijtihad that is suspicious. You can identify fatwas that are probably problematic. Um, atheism as another religion, yes, in the sense that atheism for many is just some form of scientism, where science becomes a religion, and even though science is just a methodology uh, that gives you whatever results come out of that methodology as empirical data, the ideology that it solves all problems and can be a source of ethics, when that's not what it deals with. Uh, science doesn't deal with ethics, science deals with matter and energy, not decisions uh, such as ethics. So yes, for some it is a religion, or at least it definitely has an ideology. Um, Yes, it is good to read, but I would suggest you try and attend programs. Uh, this way I think it would be good to find out which other organizations in the UK uh, have programs on atheism by people who have, you know, seen it, they've responded, it's not new. Uh, it saves you a lot of uh, time and effort. Um, yes, it is true, my sister mentioned, uh, that a lot of issues Actually, um, uh, scholars of Usul would tell you that um, nearly 90% of fiqh, 90% of fiqh is really dhanni. It's area, it's gray areas, the scholar said, that's what he said. The things that are up with Bukati Dilala, the, those fundamentals, they're very few. Um, they are very explicitly clear. That's why Muslims don't argue. Is alcohol halal or haram? It's a black and white issue. Yeah. Um, it does a hereafter exist. It's a black and white issue for Muslims. And you don't have diversity of opinions among Muslims or Muslim schools of thought. 
but on many other issues. The moment you hear, oh, scholars differ, please calm down. Yeah, to, uh, today in the car we were discussing with Imam. Somebody said about mortgage. I just told him it's haram. I said, ah, why not tell him scholars differ? Yeah, why? Because it's not about is it haram, forget context. That is when you are giving the hukum on something, not a fatwa. Hukum is simply saying, um, is alcohol haram? Yes, of course. Why? There's a verse. Okay, that's a hukum. But when you say, but an individual who is in this situation, ah, now you're going to give a fatwa. Why? Because context matters. Because every hukum uh, from the Quran or from the Hadith, uh, what they call Ahkam uh, Sharia, Taklifia, those judgments have another segment they call Ahkam Wadhiya, which is those terms and conditions. You know, in every there's terms and conditions. Or in my economy, they talk about satirist parallels, all things being equal. So, for example, we say Maghrib prayer is fard. Is that correct? But it's only fard when Maghrib time has come. It's only fard if you're not menstruating. It's only for if. So there's all this depend on, depend on, depend on. Which sometimes the person you are talking to, circum his circumstances are not the satirist parables, are not the all things being equal. And so there's a roksa, there's a concession. And that's why fatwas come in to make the thing that is normally haram to be halal. That's called fatu zariya or istisan. Or sometimes something that is halal becomes haram and that is called sadu zariya. Where something that is normally okay is clearly going to lead to something haram and fatwas will be different from a hukum. But this requires the study of usul to appreciate uh, how scholars can show there's actually a systematic way of doing it and it's not arbitrary, anybody do it the way you want. Um, handling apostates, do you cut off from them and all of that? Um, when somebody <coughs> leaves a religion, uh, or your daughter is a Muslim but she goes and marries a person of another faith, or uh, your son is a Muslim and he leaves Islam, etc. Yes, you may not be able to bring him back, but he's still your son, he's still your responsibility in the eyes of Allah. Because you can't solve all problems, doesn't mean, okay, send him over to the devil. <laughs> you know? Yeah. The question is, what can you do to address the reasons why the person changed? If keeping a relationship with that person may help guide them, okay, may not guide them, but could help your relationship with their children, and you can influence their children, just don't give up hope. Don't look at it as because they've left Islam, I've washed my hands off. Then you can't do anything. And then the person is even angrier with you. And they go and get their new parents. And you've lost a child. That's not what you gave birth to children for. So you must do the best you can to the last minute. You never give up hope. And keep on praying. But also learning. And of course for a lot of this, prevention is better than cure. And this is why it's important to start early. Um, what kids are being taught about LGBT? Uh, again, uh, the different aspects of it. Uh, the lesbian side is really more closer to, over to uh, masturbation, which is not as severe as something like gay homosexual relations, even in Sharia. It's not like it's all one. The other thing is, why it is haram, and nobody is arguing about is it haram or halal. There are other things that in Sharia are clearly considered worse and that even have clear had punishments like zina of marriage is greater an offense than zina of the unmarried. And that's why in the Hanbali, sorry, in the Hanafi school, even the question of, so what do you do? We're talking even in Islamic concept, in the context, not even here. What do you do? If somebody commits a sexual uh, act of uh, sexual immorality, eh, where did they do it? Did they do it publicly enough for four people to see? So it's not that they did something wrong, but publicly enough. That's what the hand, that's what punishment is for. If it was done in a public place where only three people can saw it, what can you do in Islamic law with that case? Nothing. You can't even take it to court. Why? Because the judge will ask how many witnesses. You say, well, there are three of us. Each one of you will get 80 lashes for puzzle. You know, so, you know, 
the need to look at this, sometimes I find the emotion around the subject of LGBT, we treat it as if it's worse than shirk, as if it's worse than murder, as if it's worse than that guy who is sleeping with that other person's wife. And we bring so much emotion that we don't handle it, that is so embarrassing. No, get out of my house. They send you to the village, whatever, and we let things get worse. So, yes, we don't have time to discuss this in more detail, but one simple thing is with the kind of criteria that, okay, so long as there's consent, so long as there's, it's okay, it means it's okay. But then it's okay then if a man and his daughter would have a sexual relation, if to them there's consent. It's okay between a man and another woman who he's not married to. It's okay between a man and his pet, if the pet is also okay. Like, where do you stop if you say that's the criteria? Because if that's the criteria, the question is, what else? From a purely scientific point of view, what's wrong with eating human flesh? What's cannibalism? It's all, I mean, dead meat, you won't put it in the ground. It's protein. You know, so there are some things that are haram. Your creator and part of Islam is not that everything I must be satisfied with why before I go with what the creator says. Unless there's a question mark regarding whether the creator made it haram or not, or whether there is uncertainty in that regard. But if your doctor is very categorical and you have no question regarding his credentials, that this is the medicine you take, you don't argue with the doctor. If a statement by Allah is made, and there's no question mark about it, what's Allah's qualification. And you know, Allah is most merciful and He knows more. And Allah is clear that a particular thing is haram. Or the Prophet made it clear there's no argument, there's not a zanni issue in which there's this level of speculation. Then we respect that as Muslims. And the last one is on the issue to do with existence of God. What are the arguments uh, that are given? I would refer you to a book called There Is a God by Anthony Flew. Anthony Flew, and PDFs are available online for that book. Anthony Flew was one of the most respected atheists of the second half of the last century. Yeah. He is the, actually, when, you see, when they write the book, there is no and they cancel no and put a god. Yeah. Um, he looked at the arguments that he was using, that many new atheists are using, and he went one by one to deconstruct his own arguments. That's a very good book I would recommend. Uh, very briefly, <clears throat> evolution only explains how life changed from one form to another. The theory of evolution doesn't explain where did life come from. So when you're going to discuss biological evolution, you're saying, okay, this microcellular or unicellular organism gradually evolved through natural selection and mutation, etc., in the following ways. And Muslim scholars have held at least three different views on evolution. There's a book, um, actually, if you go to the Dawa Institute website, there's a book called Is Boko Haram? Is Boko, that's Western education, Haram? 35 responses uh, against uh, conventional Western education that are used by the Boko Haram group. One of the arguments Boko Haram has against Boko is that evolution is taught. So there you can get a two-page summary of the differing views of scholars on evolution and further reading uh, Islam the Quantum Question. There are a number of books for those interested in that. So that's by the side. Um, Anthony Flew answers questions just very briefly. Um, the design argument is usually used for matter and energy to say all of this design points to an intelligent designer. The argument of evolution is that, well, it looks like design, but it's actually natural selection. It's trial and error that has finally produced this. The argument that Anthony Flew presents 
is to go beyond the design and even say the laws of nature, the laws of physics, the laws that govern evolution, who made those laws? If those are the laws that bring matter into existence, if those are the laws that govern how energy behaves, and these precede matter and energy, who's the lawmaker? Because the laws didn't make themselves. And that's why even Stephen Hawkins, from a theoretical point of view, was saying, theoretically, if there was only the law of physics, the law of gravity, it would be enough to start all the other laws into motion. But that still doesn't answer the question, did the law of gravity create itself? No. So you're still stuck with who's the original lawmaker and the one that ensured the law of gravity produced all others. So even if you take that. The argument of self-replicating life. You can say, well, accidentally, with uh, ammonia gases and all sites of um, nearly impossible things, the impossible happened and life came out accidentally. That's already one feat. But to say life came out and didn't just die, no, it came prepackaged with the ability to replicate itself. 